so yeah, so so uh, I've been at Farmingdale for about 15 years, like a native uh, Long Islander. And um, before I, I was able to secure my position at Farmingdale, I was in graduate school. And in graduate school, I studied about invasive plants. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a horticulturist. I'm a whole plant horticulturist. I, I love plants. Uh, I look at plants not only from the ornamental perspective of how they can beautify our landscapes, but also you know, more holistically at how plants and how good landscape design can have a net positive benefit, not only to our landscapes, but to the general ecosystem and the environment uh, in which we live. And, and that's an important uh, idea with contemporary horticulture is you know, horticulture will always be uh, dedicated in some way <clears throat> to beautifying our, our, uh, our living environment, creating a more healthy place for all of us to spend time, whether it's recreationally or in our residential environment. But what's important to realize is that horticulture has evolved, especially in the last uh, 20, 30 years, to really incorporate more themes and more imperatives of sustainability, uh, embracing of native plants, and trying to create landscapes that are not only productive for people, but also productive for the various organisms that we uh, share our environment with. So I just wanted to uh, put that out there. And, uh, you know, I, my undergraduate college was at, up at Cornell. I was actually a biology major up at Cornell. So I have a, you know, a general biology background. And then uh, once I graduated from, uh, from my undergraduate, I went on to the University of Connecticut <clears throat> up in stores, Connecticut, where I was uh, in the plant science department. And that's where I got my, my master's degree and also my, my doctoral degree. So that kind of brought me to Farmingdale. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat's a little bit scratchy this morning. And uh, I guess the rest is, uh, you know, current history. So uh, I've been working with invasive plants for, uh, I guess, over 20 years now, about half my, uh, half my life. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about invasive plants. It's a very fluid field. It's something that is very much in the public consciousness as many uh, states and municipalities have sort of embraced the idea and engaged in legislation and laws aimed at uh, curbing the use of invasive plants, but I don't know uh, exactly what everyone's knowledge base is uh, here, but I just want to, uh, I just want to make sure that you all have a solid background. And, you know, this is a very informal uh, lecture here. So if you have any questions as I'm going through uh, my slides and such, you know, please feel free to, uh, to unmute. I don't have any, uh, any objection to that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen and we can look at my slides. Let me. Yeah, your slides are coming up, Jonathan. And I just want to tell you, like, you know, many of our students have been pulling out a lot of uh, plants, uh, weeds, quote unquote weeds. Okay. in both the preserves as well as in the farming areas. So okay. everything from mugwort to porcelain berry to everything right. else. They've been pulling things out, but I don't think we have been telling them why and what and <laughs> <laughs> what's a weed and so okay. on. So really, I, I think this is perfectly in time. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, very good. So um, one of the first sort of, uh, you know, difficulties with this whole invasive plant issue is kind of getting a, um, a feel for terminology. And that's always something that's very important when uh, you know, I'm, I'm educating my students or when you're approaching any complex issue is that you know, semantics, words are very powerful, as you know, in all aspects of society. And what happens very often with uh, the invasive plant debate is we wind up throwing around different words in a very sort of loosey-goosey, sort of cavalier fashion. And when we don't have a good concept of what these words mean, it kind of clouds the issue. 
and leads to lots of disinformation and confusion and such. And uh, I won't have a chance to kind of really, <clears throat> you know, clarify each of these words today, but we'll actually touch on, on some of these. So obviously in red here, we have, you know, invasive as this kind of very um, powerful concept, but invasive cannot be separated totally from another from a number of other sort of related concepts and i'm sure you've all heard these terms over time maybe even in the activities that you're doing with rewild obviously native and non-native those are two words that two concepts that are very important but then there's also words like exotic and naturalized and of course sort of the the grand you know father the grandmother of all of these words which is this word uh, weed. And I wanted to kind of start uh, with that here. So, you know, when we talk about plants, people tend to um, have immediate sort of uh, conceptions of what a plant is in terms of its utility. So is it a desirable plant? Is it something that we want to grow for its beauty? for its edible value. You know, I'm sure many of you might have vegetable gardens right now, you know, tomato plants and uh, blueberries or enjoying your fresh blueberries. And also, of course, there are plants that maybe aren't grown primarily for people, but are there to serve our sort of partners in the landscape, all the pollinators, bees, insects, birds, rodents, microorganisms in the microbiota, that are in the soil. So, you know, depending upon how you view a plant, you will come to some judgment in your mind as to whether that plant is useful or good, or is it undesirable and bad? And that's where this concept of weed comes in. So, you know, you can look up in the dictionary, of course, and see, you know, what is a weed? And, you know, there's all sorts of complex definitions, but to simplify it, a weed is simply a plant that is not valued where it is growing. And that seems to be very sort of, um, you know, let's say abstract in that it's not a black and white question. And that is really one of the important take homes of, of my talk here today is the ability to separate a personal judgment, an objective sort of determination, something that you decide versus a more biological science-based decision as to what may be good or bad. And that's one of the reasons why this invasive and native versus non-native debate gets so complicated is we're sort of mixing our personal opinions, our personal concept with science. And one of the things that I try to really sort of uh, reinforce is that when we're using a term like invasive, that's a term that has a distinct biological definition, meaning that it's governed by measurable parameters. Whereas when we look at a word like a weed, weed is the exact opposite. The term weed does not have any scientific meaning. It's what we would call an artificial or human construct, meaning that when we use the term weed, it is simply something, it's a label. It's a label that we apply for personal convenience. So when we see a plant that bothers us, we call it a weed. But other people may see that same exact plant and find that plant to be desirable, and they will not call it a weed. So what we're getting at is there's no firm definition for what constitutes a weed. So you see here, you know, plants you're probably familiar with. You see the picture on the left is a, a field of dandelions. Hopefully you all are intimately familiar and can identify the plant in the center, which is our, uh, our uh, constant companion poison ivy, uh, roots or toxicodendron radicans, and then does anybody know what the plant is on the right? Anybody ever see a, uh, a roadside or a situation like that where you have this kind of dense shroud of green leaves? Maybe you've traveled uh, particularly to parts of the south. Anyone know what that is? 
feel free to unmute and uh, give a guess that plant in the picture on the right. Anyone know? Is that tumbleweed? Sorry, I'm sorry, a little bit louder. Is that tumbleweed? Is that tumbleweed? I'm sorry, I have trouble. Oh, is that tumbleweed? Trumbleweed. Yes. Like I'm, those um those dry plants that like you find in the desert that kinda... Oh tumbleweed. No, it's it's not it's not tumbleweed. It's actually a vine. It's a vine that grows very vigorously and can kind of just uh, cover like other plants, other ecosystems. Anyone know what it might be? You don't, it's okay. That's why we're doing this. It's okay. They call that kudzu. Kudzu, it's K-U-D-Z-U. And if you want to do some uh, little bit of independent research, you know, uh, when you have a few minutes, go online and look up kudzu, K-U-D-Z-U. It's a plant that was originally imported from uh, Asia. It was imported purposely to this country to serve various functions like uh, erosion control and uh, soil improvement. But unfortunately, this vine, which is in the lagoon family, it's in the same family as things like clover and peas, it escaped. It escaped, especially in parts of the South, and it has gone on to become one of the worst invasive plants, completely covering millions of acres of woodland, of roadside, of natural habitats, and um, it's become uh, definitely a problem. But let's just focus, before I go on the next slide here, if you look at the plant in the center, poison ivy, obviously poison ivy elicits lots of very strong opinions from folks because many people, maybe even yourself, are very sensitive to the oil that's contained in its leaves. So for that reason, many folks in their, when they have encountered poison ivy in their landscape or in any a landscape, they will react violently and see that plant as a weed, an undesirable plant, and they will seek to remove it uh, in some way, to destroy it in some way. And that's extremely understandable. But you have to realize that, that uh, poison ivy is actually a native species. It's a plant that's been here for tens of thousands of years, way before any of us, any uh, at least uh, you know European uh, individuals were here in this uh, in this country. And the plant actually serves ecological functions. For example, you may come across right now a poison ivy, uh, a mature plant growing on a tree that is bearing fruit, little berries. Right now, the berries are green but they will turn a bright white in the fall and they will persist over winter. And it turns out that the berries on poison ivy serve an important ecological function for providing sustenance to birds, especially native overwintering birds will eat the fruit. And there's other functions of shelter, et cetera, other ecological functions that poison ivy can serve. So right there you see, depending upon your perspective, Poison ivy can be seen obviously as a, a bad actor or a weed, or if you adopt a more, let's say, um, biological or conservation minded focus, you might look at and focus on the wildlife benefits of the plant and see that it's not a weed. So again, important to realize that while it's very easy to put labels on things, that those labels are fluid and different people will see the plant in a different light depending upon their perspective. So another concept which ties into this, and I, I think some of you may have some experience with this, is this idea of native versus non-native. And this kind of gets to the crux of the issue in that we're always con uh, concerned with the provenance of our plants. And provenance may be a new word to you. It's, it's a, a pleasant word. Provenance simply means the geographic origin of our plants. So for example, each of us has a provenance uh, where our ancestors may have come from in, around the world. And plants also have a provenance where they came from. 
I think somebody may have unmuted because I'm hearing some feedback. So if, uh, if you could just uh, mute that. Is, uh, yeah, very good. Thank you. So provenance is a more global concept, simply looking at the geographic origin of plants. And you can see from my simple string of cartoons here, my pictures, that it depends on your perspective. So we could look at the entire world. We could look at the United States, and then we could even go further and look at, of course, New York, Long Island, Suffolk County, et cetera, et cetera. So when somebody tells you that they want to grow a landscape that is composed primarily of native plants, that may seem very simple because, again, it looks like it's black and white, native versus non-native. But it's not that simple because it all depends on you. It depends on you, or as I tell my students at Farmingdale, your, uh, your clients or your bosses or whatever, it depends how you define native. And what I mean by this is many times people will look at native plants as those that are simply native to the United States meaning that those plants that were present here in the United States before European colonists arrived here in the 17th century. Now, I think all of you know that the United States is a huge area, right? So a couple thousand miles, you know, east, west, and north, south. So saying, if, I'm, if my perspective is as a horticulturist or a conservationist, here in Suffolk County to say that a plant that comes from Washington State or California or Oregon is native, obviously that kind of makes it might raise a red flag for you. That might be a kind of stop and sort of scratch your chin and say, well, I don't know. You know, if I'm here in New York and I'm growing a plant from California, is that really any different? than being here in New York and growing a plant from China or Japan. Do you see what I mean? So I think you, you, you might agree that it's not as simple as saying that I want to grow plants from the United States. You know, the United States is, is wonderful. I, you know, I, I love my country, but you have to realize that political divisions, countries are also a human artificial construct, meaning that the idea of the United States or Canada or Mexico or any country from a, from a biological perspective is meaningless, right? So when birds are migrating, you know, right now I'm lucky I have a couple of ruby-throated hummingbirds, our only native uh, East Coast hummingbird species, and they're, you know, pollinating my trumpet honeysuckle, you know, multiple times a day. But in a few short months, unfortunately, they will decide that it's uh, you know, too cold here for them and they will migrate south into Central America. Now, when that ruby-throated hummingbird, along with thousands of its, uh, its comrades, crosses over, let's say, from Texas into Mexico, that uh, sort of transnational crossing is meaningful to us. But to the bird, to every other organism, it has no meaning. So political divisions, countries, it's simply something that we have created for our own convenience. From a biological perspective, from a conservation perspective, whether a plant lives on one side of the border between New York and Pennsylvania, it has no meaning. So again, what I'm trying to tell you is I'm not trying to be uh, some sort of anarchist or sort of, you know, <laughs> advocate that we shouldn't have political divisions. That's important to how we live. But what I'm trying to get at is that from a, from a biological perspective or a conservation perspective, when you think of where a plant or an animal comes from, simply saying that it lives on one side or another side of a border may be a bit sort of superficial and meaningless. And we have to look at more the idea of communities of plants, natural communities, and use that as perhaps more of a meaningful way of classifying our plants, not saying whether it lives in Nassau and Suffolk County, 
but saying, does it come from a maritime uh, coastal ecosystem or from an upland mixed deciduous forest? Or does it come from a grassland remnant in the Hempstead Plains? That maybe those sorts of classifications are more meaningful than saying that it comes from North Hempstead or Hempstead or Brookhaven or Iceland. So again, I think you, you get my idea here that native versus non-native, just like the concept of a weed versus a non-weed is perhaps a bit more of a complex topic than uh, we're led to believe. So, you know, I'm, I'll just illustrate this with a concept here. You know, as you drive around right now, as you spend time uh, in the, the preserves or the uh, landscapes that you're working in, you'll see a number of plants that are really sort of beautiful right now. So for example, you may see growing in a sunny sort of uh, sandy roadside or the edge of a field, you may see Queen Anne's lace. And definitely as you go almost anywhere these days, you will see clumps of this herbaceous plant with these bright, beautiful orange lily-like flowers, which is our daylily, our quote unquote, native day lily. Now these are plants that are ubiquitous in our landscape. They're everywhere, Queen Anne's lace and the day lily. And because of that, because they're so familiar to us, they're so common, many people think that they are native. But when you look at the natural histories of these plants, what you realize is they are actually exotic plants. And not only are they exotic plants, but they are naturalized. So now we have another term, right? Now is where you're, you're, you start to roll your eyes because, ah, you know, first he's talking native, non-native, and he's talking about weeds and vases, and now he's throwing out this other concept. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out that Queen Anne's lace, this beautiful, what would they call an umbellifera flower, is actually a undomesticated relation to the carrots that we eat every day. So it turns out that when Europeans first came here again in the mid 17th century, they brought with them many of the plants that were useful to them, one of which was carrot. Carrots are very healthy, easy to grow root crops, that very interesting sort of tuberous root. And they planted these carrots, you know, throughout the East Coast. And eventually those carrots went to seed and they have spread. So when you see Queen Anne's lace growing in a roadside, it actually is a primitive relative of the carrots that you put in your soup or you dip into blue cheese when you're watching sports or whatever it might be. And if you, when you're, next time you're pulling up uh, a Queen Anne's lace uh, weed and you, uh, well, before you compost or before you throw it out, reach down and sort of look at the crown where the leaves meet the roots and you'll see a swelling there and a tap root. And if you break it and smell it, it will smell just like the carrots that you're familiar with uh, that you eat for dinner. So it turns out that the plant is actually an exotic non-native plant, but it's been here for 400 or more years. And because of that, many people think that it's native. The same thing for the daylily. The daylily that you see everywhere with those orange flowers, turns out that the daylily actually comes from parts of China. That's where it's originally native to. It was it's been grown in this country since at least the early 19th century since the early 1800s, and it has been spread by people growing it for the beautiful flowers in, its in their gardens. And because it is a perennial, because it has very strong root systems and tuberous underground roots, it is very permanent and it spreads slowly as well. So these are examples of non-native plants, but because they are so tenacious and because they have such good biological strategies to maintain themselves, they actually grow and perpetuate themselves in our landscape really without any action on our parts. So that if we abandoned Long Island for 20 years and we came back, no doubt we would still see Queen Anne's lace and this 
what we call tawny daylily, Hemericalis fulva, we would see these plants still growing very happily. And in fact, they probably would have increased their colonies. They would have gotten more numerous during that 20 years that we were gone. So we say that they are naturalized. And by naturalized, we simply mean that they have spread and they grow without any input on our part. So, you know, here you see some beautiful pictures of spring scenes. Some of you may be familiar with these plants, daffodils, crocus. And when these plants are flowering in April and May, oftentimes you'll see a landscape or a park or an abandoned uh, homestead upstate where there'll be thousands and thousands of daffodils just growing, you know, across that landscape. And you might say to yourself, yeah, well, who planted those? And in many cases, the answer is nobody. In many cases, it's that, well, somebody planted them maybe 75 years ago, a small clump of them, but the plants have actually been reproducing themselves and they have naturalized in that landscape. So they are growing, they are reproducing, they are spreading without any impact from us. Now, as a horticulturist, as a, a gardener, you might look at those scenes and say that they're beautiful, and they are. You know, few people would look at a field of golden daffodils and say that it's anything but beautiful. But if you have a more ecological or conservation-minded focus, you might look at that same picture in the upper uh, left here and say, that's a travesty. You know, here we have a native uh, or a a, a woodland in northern Nassau County or in Connecticut. And instead of having the native understory plants that we would expect to see there, all trilliums and uh, you know, jack in the pulpits or whatever it might be, here we have these exotic daffodils, narcissus, that were originally imported from places like Southern Europe and the Near East. And these plants have taken over and they are dominating. So again, it just illustrates that two people, three people look at the same situation and depending upon your perspective, whether your perspective is that of a gardener, a horticulturist, a conservationist, an ecologist, you will see the same scene extremely differently based upon what your value system is. And it's not that anything is right or wrong. It's, that's not for me to tell you that your perspective is correct or incorrect. And you shouldn't tell me that my perspective is correct or incorrect. It's just different ways of looking at the same uh, situation. And that's why all these issues that you're dealing with of native plants, non-native plants, invasive plants are very, very complex and they elicit lots of strong emotions from people because nobody wants to be told that the way that they think is wrong. And it often can be very difficult to convince somebody to see something in a slightly different uh, light. So that's why this issue, again, is such a, a gripping and different, a difficult one. I'll, I'll move a little bit quicker here. I know we have you know, limited time, but you know, so we have this idea of native and non-native. And when we say native and non-native, we can use another term we can say non-native, or we can also say the term exotic. The term exotic has all different sorts of connotations, but when we use the term exotic in terms of ecology or conservation biology or horticulture, we simply mean that it comes from an area overseas. So you see here in this map, I've circled parts of Europe and parts of East Asia, and those are the two areas of the world where most of our non-native plants originate. Or another way of saying it is if you look at the provenance, the geographic origin of most of our non-native plants, you'll see that many of them are derived from parts of Europe, parts of um, North Africa, the Middle East, and then also a wide uh, variety come from places like Japan, Korea, and um, China. Does anybody have a, a theory as to why those two areas that I circled 
are the primary origins of our non-native plants. Anyone have any theory or hypothesis as to why that might be true? Maybe because er those areas have the warm, moist, humid climate that is necessary for most plants to germinate and grow. Okay, so very good. So right away, you're focusing on climate. You're focusing on sort of weather. Exactly. So it's definitely that's definitely true. So can anyone expand on that? So yes, it's something about the weather, something about the environmental or climate conditions. But how? Why is it that those two areas that are circled? What is it about though about the climate conditions there that makes the plants so well suited to Long Island tri-state area East Coast? Anyone want to just expand on that, that, that good start? Don't be afraid. There's no, there's no right or wrong answer, but what is it about the climate there? Or I'll, 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 I'll uh, frame it in another way. Why is it that we don't have a lot of plants in our local environment that come from places like Sub-Saharan Africa, South America, and Australia? Think of it that way. That all that can help maybe uh, you know, make more sense. So why is it that we don't have lots of plants growing uh, naturally in our areas that come from those parts of the world, sort of sub, uh, you know, below the equator? Anyone want to give a shot now? They're not at the same latitude. Very good. Okay. Yep. That's very. That's correct. They're not at the same latitude. And what is related to that latitude? It's a much You're, different climate. Different climate. There we go. So we got there. Very good. Exactly right. So yes. So when we look at the exotic introduced non-native plants that perpetuate, that grow well in Long Island, typically they have to originate. They have to have a provenance that is of similar climate to our local area. So, you know, in latitude, that was a great answer. So latitude, if we draw these latitude lines, what you see is that my two green circles here are pretty much in line with Long Island, right? So if I move my cursor right across here, I just crossed over Long Island and look, I'm going right through Europe, right through Asia. So basically areas that are at the same latitude often have somewhat similar weather, somewhat similar climate. And it's not surprising that plants and animals that originated in other parts of the world that have similar weather and similar environmental uh, parameters, they have similar tolerances. So for that reason, they can be transplanted from Europe, from China, from Japan, and brought here to the tri-state area. And those plants and animals often behave as if they were still at home. They grow well here, they can reproduce here, they thrive. So that's one of the keys to predicting which plants and animals will uh, become potentially weedy or invasive here in our area. Okay, so let's get to the crux of our discussion here. We've, we've gotten through a lot of good uh, introductory ideas. You've helped me with that, which I appreciate. So now let's get to this idea of an invasive plant. Well, it turns out that invasive plants are a fairly exclusive club. And what we have with invasive plants is we have a small subgroup of non-native plants, which for some reason, when they were transplanted from a similar climate, whether it's, let's say, Europe, or Asia, when they were taken from those areas and brought here, they are so well adapted to Long Island, to the tri-state area, that they behave here as they would in their natural area. They are reproducing, they're self-seeding, they are expanding, and they have become naturalized. So again, by naturalized, we mean that they are now reproducing by themselves. They are permanent, even without any input of our own, but something else has happened. And this is one of the keys 
the primary key to being invasive is when we as scientists, conservationists, when we look at the impact of these naturalized exotics, we can show objectively using science that the presence of these plants in our environment is causing a negative impact. And that's crucially important. That's why I said at the beginning of my, my narrative earlier, that we have to be careful when we apply a term like invasive, because invasive will suggest that the plant has to cause measurable damage. So if you look at the third bullet here in my slide, it is causing measurable damage. Now we'll get we'll we'll discuss maybe what that what that means, but what I want you to really take home here is that the idea of an invasive plant is a very, it's more of a scientific biological concern. You know, anybody can walk around their garden or park or preserve and say, that's a weed, that's a weed, that's a weed. You can just kind of grin and smile and nod your head because again, to them, those plants may be bothersome and they're calling them a weed. Okay, but when someone says that plant's invasive, that plant's invasive, that plant's invasive, that's where you have to stop for a section and think, is that plant truly causing damage? Is that plant really hurting other organisms or is it uh, interrupting natural cycles of plant decomposition? Is it influencing the carbon cycle? Is it doing something that I can show or that scientists can show is actually causing a problem? And maybe I go out into the woods and with my graduate students, I show that the presence of this burning bush, this shrub that you see here in the picture and having it growing in Oyster Bay, maybe it's causing the um, pH of the soil to be increased. It's becoming more basic, more alkaline. And because of that, certain sorts of microorganisms in the soil can no longer proliferate and that is influencing the rate of breakdown of organic matter. So basically the presence of that plant is changing a cycle, a biological cycle in this environment that I can show. And if another group of scientists, another people I don't know, another university, whatever, if they go out and analyze the same phenomenon, they should hopefully come to the exact same conclusion. And that's the beauty of science, that we want to have multiple people who can look at the same issue and come to the same conclusion. We call that reproducibility. And science has to be reproducible in order to be meaningful, right? You wouldn't want to be taking a COVID vaccine that only one lab determined was useful. You'd want to have many different doctors, many different scientists that did trials that showed that that vaccine was useful. And then you'd have much more confidence that what they were saying was true. Well, it's the same thing with declaring a plant invasive. We should have many different scientists, universities, government organizations that have looked at an issue and come to the same conclusion. That's when we can sort of say with more of a degree of reli reliability that yes, this plant is really a problem. It's causing damage and then it should perhaps be declared, ooh, perhaps be declared, ooh, went way too far there, invasive. Let me just go back here right. and speed that up. Anyone have any questions at the moment? Question? I think, uh, yeah, I had a question, um, Jonathan, one is, just as you said that scientifically, we are able to uh, quantify the negative impact of certain plants on the environment right. and call them invasive, yeah. Um, likewise, is there any way of quantifying the, is there a beneficial impact from native plants or a diversity of native plants? Is there any specific, uh, uh, is that also a scientific concept and a scientifically, scientifically provable concept? I, I would say yes. I would say that the same way you could do a, an, an investigation of the negative impact of a non-native or exotic that's a, you, from on the flip side of that is you could show that the presence of a native species is having a positive impact on pollinators 
or it's having a positive impact as providing uh, shelter for um, you know, breeding uh, birds or that its fruit is providing sustenance for migratory songbirds in the fall. So yes, I mean, you know, science works in all, you know, science is not biased. So science can show us things that we see as being negative with an invasive, but science can also help prove or strongly suggest that something is positive. So if you had multiple investigators, scientists, universities that were looking at a species of milkweed and showing that that species of milkweed was having a, you know, that it was strongly preferred by certain species of native butterflies and was, they were more successful with rearing their larvae, their young on that plant, then yes, you could come to a, a conclusion that the presence of that plant in the environment is having a positive impact for that, uh, for that species. Does that, that, does that make, answer your question kind of? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, when we, look at when we look at invasiveness, here are some of the, again, biological traits that characterize true invasive plants. And we've discussed a couple of these. So one, yes, the plant has to be non-native. Now, remember, non-native, that is tied to your perspective. So if you are operating as we all are here in Nassau and Suffolk County, a plant would have to be non-native to Nassau and Suffolk County. But if you were to move down to North Carolina or Seattle, Washington, or to uh, you know, Phoenix, Arizona, obviously then that idea of native, non-native would be different. So what I'm suggesting there is that just because you declare a plant invasive in one part of the country does not mean that it's invasive in another part of the country. So what I'm trying to sort of really um, you know, uh, hammer home, reinforce with you is that this is a powerful term and it should not be used indiscriminately. And also it has to be always um, guided by where you are geographically. A plant that is invasive in New York state may not be invasive in Pennsylvania. A plant that's invasive in Pennsylvania may not behave in an invasive manner in Arkansas. So it's a very regional concept and that's very important. When these plants are spreading, they usually show some strong adaptation to spread. And that's in that they're producing abundant propagules. So a propagule is just a very fancy way of saying that they produce lots of seeds, lots of fruit. Those fruit can be eaten by birds, can be eaten by rodents. They can also be carried by forces like wind and water. So the plant has an effective way of spreading. It has what we call a vector, V-E-C-T-O-R. And a vector is simply a force that spreads the plant. And again, it can be animals, birds, water, wind. And I also can tell you it's often people. So we are probably the most effective vectors of invasive plants. We physically transport animals, plants, organisms, bacteria, viruses. We transplant them and move them everywhere as we move. Sometimes it's done purposely and also many times it's done and we don't even know we're doing it. So we are extremely important vectors of, of invasive uh, species. Once the plant moves from one environment to another, it has some genetic ability to quickly establish. You know, you're a tiny little seedling in a forest. You have to be able to get your roots out and establish a foothold fairly quickly so that you can survive, especially survive that first winter if you're a perennial. So quick establishment. Once you're uh, established, usually invasive plants will show rapid growth. They will quickly grow, they'll establish more leaves, which gives them more of a photosynthetic advantage. They can start accumulating um, starch, they can strengthen their, uh, their bodies, and they are aggressive competitors. So that's very important as well. 
an aggressive competitor, meaning that it is having a negative impact on the surrounding environment. And I can't really stress that enough because you might be walking around later today, taking a walk and you come across dandelions. Everyone knows dandelions here. Now dandelions are exotic. They were in, introduced from Eurasia three, 400 years ago. You know that dandelions spread everywhere, right? Dandelions is an entire industry dedicated to you know, eradicating dandelions from your lawn, so they spread everywhere. But the question is a dandelion, is Paraxicum officinale, the dandelion, is that plant invasive? And the vast, vast majority of scientists will say no, the dandelion is not invasive. Why? Because dandelions have not been shown to have a negative impact on natural ecosystems, on native species. Dandelions are what we would call a good example of an agricultural weed. They are, they are very good at establishing in disturbed environments, places that we have altered, like lawns, roadsides, agricultural fields. When we disturb that area, the dandelion has an ability to self-seed and perpetuate itself for a period of time. But we don't typically see dandelions establishing and disturbing sort of closed, you know, stable ecosystems. So a dandelion is definitely exotic or non-native. It's definitely a weed, because again, it bothers many people, dandelion, so it's a weed, but is a dandelion invasive? And the answer is no, okay? But if you look at the two plants that are pictured here on the, uh, on the right, Japanese barberry and that plant that I was quizzing you on earlier, kudzu, those are two plants which are non-native, they spread rapidly, and they can be shown to cause a negative, negative impact. So yes, they do fit the definition of being invasive, and they're in that rather exclusive group. I know my time is limited here. I just want to end with this, and of course, if we, if we have any questions, I just want you to realize that obviously we're all talking about plants today. And, uh, you know, but the invasive concept is not limited to plants. We can apply the same principles of non native spreading easily, damaging uh, ecosystems or damaging native species. We can apply those same criteria to animals, insects, microorganisms. And we can also come to the conclusion that many other sorts of um, fauna <laughs> are actually invasive. So things like certain types of beetles, viruses, you know, right? And we, I, I made this slide before COVID, but, uh, you know, we used to have a thing that which now seems like child's play, Zika virus caused by certain mosquitoes. You may have heard of northern snakehead fish. Even the, the, um, the goldfish that you might have in a bowl in your home, or maybe you have a small garden pond outside and you have goldfish and koi. Be careful because those goldfish and koi, many people will release them into local ponds and waterways. And that is a no-no because it turns out that koi and goldfish, if introduced into a local pond or wetland, can actually cause lots of damage. They can reproduce they can start competing with native fish. They can alter the turbidity of the water by disturbing the under uh, the base of the pond. You're all familiar with rats, Norway rats, which don't only come from Norway. Uh, starlings, house sparrows. Again, we all love watching house sparrows breed, you know, in our in our bird boxes and stuff. But starlings and house sparrows are not native, and in fact, there's lots and lots of evidence that these starlings and house sparrows actively um, bully, actively uh, sort of, you know, impair the ability of our native birds to breed. And they also compete for food and such. So yes, starlings and house sparrows are often considered to be invasive. Various fungal blights, and I'll leave you with one. And, you know, I love house cats, I love pets, but think of a house cat you know, your, your, your common domestic feline house cat, that's a species that does not originally come from the new world. They're from uh, parts of Africa, parts of uh, 
Southern Europe. They've been domesticated. They were brought to this country with the first Europeans, again, you know, back in the mid 1600s. Now, house cats are wonderful as pets when we keep them indoors. But what happens when you let cats outside, especially if they're abandoned outside, is they continue to breed. And if you look at the impact of feral, F-E-R-A-L, feral, or you could say naturalized house cats on our environment, scientists have shown that literally billions, and I mean that with a B, billions of native birds are killed each year by feral outdoor cats. So you could make a, a good argument that feral naturalized cats are actually behaving as an invasive species here in the United States and actually all across the world. So I don't say that to, you know, somehow criticize cats. Again, I, I love pets. I have pets. I know people who have cats. But again, it's all about the perspective and it's all about how you manage that individual. So, you know, cats are great, but we should not be letting cats, you know, uh, live outdoors uh, for their benefit, uh, for, their, for their health, but also, you know, when those cats reproduce, they have negative impacts. So again, I'm not trying to get hung up on cats, but I just want you to realize here as we end up today that these, these ideas of invasive, invasion biology, as they call it. So yes, invasion biology, is not limited simply to plants. It's also a very uh, exciting, interesting, and uh, meaningful study of invasive species that come from other groups, including uh, birds, rodents, mammals, insects, uh, you know, uh, mollusks, everything. So anyway, uh, I appreciate your, uh, your attention today. I hope this was uh, in some way uh, useful or illuminating, or at least raise additional questions in your mind and at the very least showed you that some of these concepts that we see as being very simple or black and white are anything but. And, uh, you know, that's not to confuse you, but you, know, you have to realize that anything in science is, you, it's usually going to be much more complex than uh, it appears on the surface. And all that means that you have to just investigate further, do more research, talk to more people, to get a, a good idea of what you're actually seeing. You know, don't take everything at face value, always do additional research, uh, ask questions, and then that way you can get a much better understanding of what you're actually seeing. Nobody has all the answers. I don't have all the answers. I don't understand the, you know, um, every single feature of every single invasive species, not at all, but again, we're all learning on a constant basis, on a daily basis. So uh, again, I, and, and in that vein, I appreciate everyone taking time here on, on a Sunday to, uh, to listen to me for a little bit. So uh, I will leave it at that. And uh, if we have any time for questions, I would be happy to uh, take some. Yeah. Anybody who has to leave because it's noon, please feel free. But those who want to stay and ask, uh, uh, talk to uh, uh, Professor Lehrer and ask him questions, please do. Um, you're welcome to. Still. And don't be shy, call out your questions. I mean, because my big question looking through this was if you apply all these objective criteria, then human beings could be considered invasive. Is that correct, Jonathan? Yes, that, that is that is correct. And uh, you know that that's that 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 the conclusion is uh, is very you know popular and it's you know people it's often said that you know human beings are the original invasive species and uh, you know ba based on that uh, sort of idea and the fact that we've altered we've disturbed basically every environment in the world <clears throat> it's not surprising that other organisms which are opportunistic you know, have sort of followed our lead and have spread into areas where they weren't, you know, uh, found before we sort of uh, paved the way for it. So yes, you know, <clears throat> we kind of, you know, stand back here and sort of, you know, high and mighty and, you know, make all these declarations and make all these conclusions. But yes, I, I think, Raju, that your, your, um, your idea is correct, is that we've sort of have paved the way for all of this. And, uh, 
you know, that's just the nature of the way things are. And what we have to try to do is see, you know, how we can kind of mitigate maybe some of the problems that we've caused and sort of, uh, you know, turn things back. And I know a lot of the activities that, that you and your volunteers and your group and your interns are doing, it's dedicated to just that, it's looking at an area that maybe has been damaged by an invasive species and then seeking to sort of, uh, you know, rehabilitate uh, that area, you know, seeing if you can, you know, remove <clears throat> those plants and then allow a more natural balance to, uh, yeah. <clears throat> to or, or, that's right. And, and based on your metaphor, uh, Jonathan, mm -hmm. I think yeah. we are trying to turn people from feral cats to house cats. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to, I, I didn't mean to pick on the, No, 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 that's cats. good. I mean, I think it's a good example of how a same species, if you yeah. manage it and uh, keep it in a certain environment and be, exactly. it's about behavior, not about the species right. itself. Right. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, but it's, it's another one of examples. It's, it's not you know black or white or good or bad. It's a matter of right management. So, you know, having a an indoor cat, you know, uh, especially if it's you know fixed or you know is not a problem. But when you kind of let something you know loose on the world, uh, you know, and you have to admire the cat. You know, it's an amazing uh, species. How adaptable it is. I mean, I, it always it always amazes me that you know I see cats outside in the winter you know, uh, somehow living, you know, by themselves uh, in that. I mean, I feel bad for them, but at the same time, you have to admire how adaptable they are. And in that respect, it's no different than a, a Norway rat or a common starling or a, uh, you know, Japanese barberry or a garlic mustard. You know, again, you have to admire that that plant through thousands of generations of evolution has been endowed with the ability to, um, you know, establish and spread and persist in this manner. So yeah, I mean, it's not a matter of looking at these species and saying that they're bad or they're evil. In some ways, it's just a matter of actually admiring how amazing they are. But unfortunately, they do create at times, uh, you know, problems. <laughs> yeah. Any any other questions? Um, Lily, Mika, Perry, Jacob. Um, yeah, is there a specific like metric to weigh out the pros and cons of a specific exotic species? Because I know I can name a few that definitely have some positives and some negatives. Right. Yeah, the, the answer is yes. The answer is that um, what, what's called invasion biology is a, now a well-established field of academic inquiry and research. And there are folks who specialize in the modeling aspect where they actually will look at a given organism and they have matrices, they have mathematical models that they can uh, plug in um, certain variables from the species and the actual algorithm can predict whether based on these traits, the organism is um, predicted to become problematic or you know, can you, as you said, I think what you're getting at more is, can you sort of weigh pros and cons that yes, a certain plant may have an invasive or may spread into an area, but maybe it's still providing copious amounts of nectar or pollen, et cetera. So can we somehow weigh the pros and the cons? I think that's probably a bit more difficult, but I'm sure there are, are uh, investigators, scientists who have, uh, developed, uh, you know, matrices or sort of models, especially mathematical models that can kind of weigh those different uh, factors. But what I would say is that if, if this interests you, there is definitely, if you look up uh, online, the idea of invasion biology, there's actually, there are journals, you know, scientific journals that are dedicated to this field, one of which is called biological invasions. So if you look up, you know, a biological invasions journal, on online, you'll probably able, you'll be able to see what they focus on, and maybe even some sample articles and such. So the answer is yes, that this is uh, a well-established science, and one of the really the frontiers of this is trying to predict new invasions. You know, uh, there's a well-known um, local uh, invasive plant group, and their motto is "No new invasions." And one of the ways that they're trying to uh, achieve that goal is by employing predictive modeling, you know, mathematical, uh, you know, algorithms, et cetera, to try to predict whether a certain organism that maybe has just been introduced or to the country 
will that organism 20, 30, 50 years from now become the next invasive species? And again, it's not gonna be 100% you know, uh, science, but it turns out there are lots of different parameters you can look at to make a good um, you know, guess, guesstimate model of whether that organism will be a problem. Thank you so much. That's really interesting. I didn't know like there was all this different stuff that went into it. Yep, yep, yep. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us. Thank you, uh, Mr. Really appreciated you being here. And I'll, yep. since we have the recording, I'll also put it out for uh, for a larger audience as well. This was fascinating. Thank you. Great. And you know, if uh, you know at any time any of your your students interns. Uh, ever you know, want to have any questions about either this topic or just you know, the, the possibilities uh, for education you know, second, uh, at Farmingdale, just you know, feel free to uh, let me know. You know in addition to horticulture, uh, Farmingdale has a, very, a really wonderful uh, biology department uh, as well, uh, including folks who are specialized in botany and uh, you know, mathematical modeling of invasive species. So, uh, you know, it definitely, there's a lot of opportunities at, at Farmingdale for, uh, you know, post-secondary uh, education. Thank you so much. Thanks okay. a lot. Have a great, great okay. day. Yes, you too. Weekend, Thanks again. Have a good the rest of the day. Thank Bye. you guys so much. This was amazing. Thank you for your time. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. It was just so... Bye.